Welcome to chapters 11 and 12 in Earth Science. Uh, we're going to be going through about 4.6 billion years worth of stuff in the next 45 minutes or so. I'm trying out a new microphone now, so we'll see if that works. I also have a new lighting system, but the sun is so bright today that even with the new lighting system, I still look like I'm sort of washed out. So I'm on to plan C as to how to not look really scary when I'm on Zoom. Uh, but someday, maybe it'll be sorted out. Uh, as for really scary, I have behind me here, uh, this is the picture from Jurassic Park. And you may remember a very clever scene where they're trying to outrun the Tyrannosaurus Rex and uh, the, the little thing on the bottom of the mirror, objects in the mirror may be closer than they appear. And that looks pretty close up, up front. We'll be talking a little bit about fossils and dinosaurs and things today. Not in great depth, no pun intended, uh, but we're going to sort of cover uh, what, what we know about the very basics of the processes by which our planet formed and over time, what we call geological time. Uh, so without any further ado, let me try to share the appropriate screen here uh, so we can get on to that. And I need for us to be at the first slide and we need to view the slideshow. So there we are, ta-da. Uh, geological time. Uh, there are different things that shape the way we understand the way our planet is. For a long time, we had the idea that uh, the landscape of the planet was shaped mostly by catastrophes, by uh, impacts of uh, asteroids, by uh, earthquakes shifting things around, by volcanoes erupting. Uh, one of the guys who was primary behind this idea is a guy named Usher. Uh, there was a, a famous Bishop Usher in uh, Ireland who concluded that the Earth was only about 6,000 years old, and we still have remnants of that today. Uh, people who are young Earth creationists are usually that because of Usher dating. And some people will pick up Bibles and they'll have 4004 BC as when the Earth was created. That actually, and I'm going to divert just a little bit from, from Earth science here into the, the idea of what the Bible is, that is not in your Bible. Now, you can open your Bible and it says, well, it's right there. Well, guess what? That was a late edition. That came thousands of years after those books were written. That was not in the original. Uh, so, so if you sort of think about it, if you're not supposed to add or take away uh, from holy text, uh, that's an addition. So there's nothing in the actual creation stories of really any of the major religions, perhaps except for Hinduism, that gives a sense of how long ago things were. And with Hinduism, we're getting into billions, maybe even trillions of years. Modern geology sees that uh, this catastrophe idea is certainly a part of what shapes things, but there's a lot more going on. And as we look at what's happening on the planet today, we can see a uniformity with what's happened in the past. And if we, we look at different parts of the planet, we can see the same forces shaping each of the continents, the, the oceans, the oceans over time, the continents over time. So we look for time perspectives and we look for a time scale. This is relative dating. So one of the things that is key in geology, key in fossils as well, uh, is this thing is older, this thing is older, this thing is older but we don't necessarily know exactly how old they are. Sort of like going into meeting a family and you have five kids that are there. You can usually tell if they're sort of kids and not all grown ups, which ones are younger and which ones are older without necessarily knowing exactly how old they are. Uh, so, so that's one of the things that we see uh, when we're dealing with stuff. When we're dealing with relative dating, we look for the sequence of information. This portion is older than this portion is older than this portion, although usually it would be reversed. The things on the top would usually be younger than the things below, depending upon the structure. If it's a dome, for example, uh, you, you would have the stuff that's oldest at the top if you watched the last lecture. If it's, if it's a, a sort of concave kind of structure, the oldest stuff will, will tend to be on the outer rim uh, rather than in the middle. 
but some things we can date numerically. So numerical dating, like limestone, might be 200 million years old, 250 million years old. Whenever we're putting a number to it, that's numerical dating. Whenever we're saying this is younger than this, this is older than this, but we don't know exactly how old, that's relative dating. And especially when we're dealing with sedimentary rocks, the beds that are above are younger, typically, than the ones that are below. Uh, so so that, we, we see that uh, in, in different ways also with the way volcanoes operate. Obviously, things that are under the lava are going to be older than the lava itself. So as we look at this, we call it superposition because we're sort of going up and up and up, and, and we have the different areas of sedimentary rock here, well, these, are, these are sedimentary rocks. And, and we can see, even though this is not an area where right now we have a lot of water, we have a lot of limestone in this area, which tells us once upon a time there was. Uh, so we have horizontal originality, we have lateral continuity, when we're sort of looking at what's sort of on top of each other. We also sort of look for how it extends out in different directions. Uh, that that there's, there's not really a lot of complexity to these ideas. But then we get things like this. And what, what do we do here? How do we talk about this in terms of horizontal and lateral stuff? Well, lateral continuity, uh, one of the things that may happen is it may be interrupted uh, by, we have a river here that's cutting through, ca uh, causing the canyon to form. Uh, we also have different layers that are sort of thinning and ending because they're abutting something else, uh, something harder or something that is, may be more active. There may be a plume underneath over on this other side here that's pushing things up. And uh, so, so as we're sort of extending across, we could tell from this canyon that the left-hand side and the right-hand side are continuous of each other. Uh, we have inclusions. We sometimes have fragments of some rocks that are inside other rocks. Uh, the inclusion is usually younger. Uh, and, and then we have cross-cutting uh, different uh, processes. And those cross-cuts are also uh, usually younger features of things that were already there. So we have the layer, uh, like going across the canyon. The canyon is newer because those layers were there uh, originally. And we can also have fault lines that are cross-cutting. We can sort of see that where, where these used to line up. Uh, we can see that just with the naked eye. These lines where they were used to be are older than the fault itself. You had something that was continuous that then sort of split apart in, in the fault line. That fault could be either a, a, a slumping, a landslide, or a, an earthquake. You don't necessarily have earthquakes just because you have faults like that. Then we have unconformities, uh, three main types. We have angular, nonconformity, and disconformity. Uh, these are breaks in the rock record. Uh, usually uh, what, what we can sort of see here, we can see an angular unconformity uh, that's here. Uh, as we're sort of looking, we have the vertical sandstone and shale down below, but then we get this shifting that takes place at the top. And this is in Scotland. Uh, you'll see these kinds of coastlines in Scotland and Ireland and uh, Norway and uh, wait for it, of course, Iceland. Uh, you get a lot of these kinds of structures uh, in, in Iceland along the way. Uh, unconformities, the angular ones are tilted flat over flat-lying rocks, so, so, so that's what we've got going on here. Uh, we then also have disconformity where we're going to have uh, some, some uh, sedimentary stuff on either side, and uh, nonconformity, which involves metamorphic and igneous rocks. And we can actually see all three of these kinds of things happening in uh, the Grand Canyon. Here's an example of how an angular nonconform unconformity might form. Uh, we have an uplift that is then eroded away. Uh, the water returns, but we have our, uh, our breaks down here in the continuity. So that would, these, these going across here would be ang angled to the rest of the uplift. So that would be an angular nonconformity. As we're looking at the Grand Canyon, uh, we can sort of see where a disconformity is here as we slope in. 
Uh, we can see non-conformity, where we have two different things that are on top of each other. Uh, this way we have these sort of angled, uh, angular unconformities here, which are going at a flattened angle on the top of other things that are at, it looks like that's about a 15 to 20 degree angle down there. But notice how many different layers we have that have been dug down into the Grand Canyon. And we can sometimes even just look across and see where those things are, the nonconformities and the uh, uh, unconformities that are there. Uh, don't worry too much about trying to identify all of these kinds of things. Just be aware that they're there. Uh, in in a, a longer class where we could do more labs, we would actually have a couple of labs where I would show you these different types of groupings and we would try to figure out which ones were in, in fact a nonconformity versus a uh, disconformity versus an unconformity. So, so uh, just sort of study those. Uh, but when we're dealing with stuff like this, uh, first of all, we're going to sort of think about number one over here. A is going to be older than B, is going to be older than C. Why? Well, it just makes sense. Things are buried over time. Uh, and, and we might get uh, something that happens underneath that will then shift things around a bit. Uh, so, so, so what's happening here is we have an uplift that can actually drain the ocean because the water will seek a lower point if that's uplifted too much. That's why we have continents and islands uh, for the most part. Some islands are volcanic. Then we can have other things, intrusions, like this rift that's coming in here. Uh, we can tell this is younger than the layers that we have because it's sort of separating out what would have been continuous along the way. Over the course of time, erosion happens on the top. Uh, we might have other uplifts or things that are happening underneath that will tilt things. So this, this uh, shifting along the way with the erosion will also then be older. If it sinks far enough, or if the ocean levels rise far enough, it could once again be covered both with water as well as other layers of sediment. So we end up with different layers that we can identify over the course of time. This is relative dating. We have no idea whether A is, is 50 million years old or 2 billion years old, uh, but we can always tell that A is going to be older than C and, and so forth. Uh, fossils also give us a sense of, of the aging. Uh, paleontology is the study of fossils. If you've ever watched the, the sitcom Friends, uh, 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 Ross Geller is, is the paleontologist uh, that's there. Mostly paleontologists are noted famously for studying dinosaurs, thanks to Jurassic Park. Uh, but but there, there's a lot more to the study of uh, fossils than just uh, uh, dinosaurs. Uh, we have different things that happen to them. We have uh, per mineralization. Uh, so this is just mineral. So you can pronounce this long word per mineralization. Uh, and, and this is uh, one of the things that happens when groundwater with mineral content will, will sort of uh, go into the, the, the tissues of whatever is there. So petrified wood, if you go to the petrified forest, for example, that's what's happened. Uh, molds and casts, if a shell is buried underground, uh, casts can get created uh, when, when we have hollow spaces, when things are filled in. We also have carbonization and impressions. Uh, impression is when the, 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 uh, the thing itself is gone, uh, but we're, we're left with sort of like, especially with shells and bones, we can have sort of the outline of things that are there. Uh, carbonization, uh, carbon is the number one element for life, for example. Uh, so carbonization, we, we end up with uh, gases and liquids being pushed out, but a layer of carbon that's still there. Uh, sometimes we have leaves and smaller animal tissues that are preserved that way. We can also get things preserved in amber. Again, Jurassic Park, thank you for the idea. Uh, mosquitoes that might have bitten uh, 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 dinosaurs might have dinosaur blood inside and then fall into amber and get preserved. Uh, so th so that, that ends up uh, as, as an interesting way. And then we get trace fossils. Uh, tracks and burrows and other kinds of things that tell us something lived here. Uh, and, and, and most things are not preserved. 
Uh, most things uh, deteriorate rather rapidly, so, so we need ideal conditions for, for things like that. So here are a couple of different examples. Uh, we have uh, sort of a mold and cast up here of uh, trilobite. Sounds like a Star Trek kind of thing, uh, but, but it's actually something here on Earth looks like an alien. Uh, it's, it's sort of alien to us in most of our lives. Uh, petrified wood, that's the permineralization. Uh, we have a fossilized bee in carbon film. Uh, we have our fossilized fish here from impressions. Uh, then we have our spider in amber. Uh, so these, these can be quite remarkable kinds of things because they're sort of capturing something before it dies so it doesn't have a chance to disintegrate or fall apart. Uh, and then we, we have our uh, coprolite, uh, which is basically poop, uh, dinosaur poop or other kinds of poop uh, that's around. There's a children's book, Everything Poops, and ev I'll, sometimes it solidifies and hardens and gets preserved long term. Uh, so when we're looking at those different kinds of things, we correlate them to our rock layers. Uh, we we uh, look for uh, correlations in fossil records. We look for correlations in uh, the layering and the, the shifting and moving around of different kinds of things. Uh, so, so one of the things that we might see here as lands move around, uh, we could see that the, the sort of the, the bottom area here of Zion National Park corresponds to the top layer at Grand Canyon, whereas uh, Bryce Canyon is even further up in elevation, it is, its bottom layer corresponds to the top of Zion. Uh, uh, and, and, and we can sort of see they're all in Utah and Arizona in the map down here. But then we also have our different uh, uh, time periods along the way. And of course, we're all very familiar because uh, Steven Spielberg hasn't made Triassic Park yet and hasn't made Cretaceous Park yet, uh, but he's made Jurassic Park. But we've got all of these different ones here. Notice we have some that are, sh uh, that are shorter than others. Some are named for states. Um, there, there's, there, there are historic reasons why things are called the way they are. I'll let you do the, the research on that yourself. It is an interesting story. Uh, in the history of science, how things get named and how things are, are done. But we, we look for fossils. We have index fossils, which are, are certain ones that tend to be widespread. We can find them in lots of places, but they didn't last very long. So they were only there for a couple of million years rather than two billion years. Uh, not too many things are there for two billion years. Uh, uh, but, but we have sort of age of fishes and age of trilobites and age of mammals. If you find a mammal bone, it's not going to be 2 billion years old. It's not going to be 1 billion years old. It's not going to be 500 million years old because there weren't mammals at that time. On the other hand, if you uh, find uh, trilobites, chances are very, very, very good. It's not going to be 200 years old. Uh, so so uh, there are some things that, that are uh, that, that give us a sense of what the relative time is. Things came before each other. Uh, that's also true with the various layers, uh, of the, the strata uh, that we find. So when we're looking at fossils, uh, sometimes we have very, very tiny. This is like, a, uh, believe it or not, this is, uh, uh, you can look in a microscope at sand and see this kind of stuff. It's, it's really fascinating. Uh, these will also give us information about environments before. Was the world hotter? Was the world cooler? Was the world mostly under seawater? Was, what were, were the temperatures of the seawater? Because we know how things grow and how things shift along the way. Uh, so, so when we have uh, uh, the age ranges of fossils, we can sort of see there, there, here's our trilobite here. Uh, clamshells can go all the way up to the present. Leaves are never going to be in the same period as trilobites, for example. And dinosaurs only really overlap with, with uh, what we would have like our, our typical stuff today in terms of, of leafiness uh, later in its period. But we have some other leaves, uh, the, the leafy plants that they were eating down here below. Starfish cover the whole, almost the whole gamut uh, that we have here. So we can tell relative to each other we find this, it's going to be younger most of the time than this. If we find this, it's definitely younger than this. If we find this, it's definitely younger. 
uh, than this. So, so that's, that's how we begin to put things together. We can also numerically date things with nuclear decay, radioactivity. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into this, but I, I'll, I'll try to post up a video on uh, 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 half-lives and, and uh, nuclear uh, activity. What happens is basically everything falls apart. Eventually everything falls apart. And we have different ways in which they can fall apart, where uh, things can be ejected from the nucleus of an atom, or we have electrons uh, that, that are, are shifting around. Uh, so we have alpha emission where we're, we're losing a clump of particles. We have beta emission where we're uh, losing a small particle. And then we have electron capture where it gets uh, pulled in uh, to, to what's happening. Uh, the main point of all of this, and I don't want to go too much into to that, take a physics course or take my astronomy course. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, along the way. But the real point is half-life and isotopes. If we have something like carbon, for example, carbon has six protons in its nucleus. It also typically has six neutrons. Sometimes it can have seven neutrons, sometimes it can have eight neutrons. It's carbon still because of the six protons. That's the way we, we determine what an element is by the number of protons. Over time, if it had eight, it will disintegrate into seven and then disintegrate into six. Uh, that if eight plus six is 14, you may have heard of carbon 14 dating. Well, the, the way that happens over time, we call that a half-life. And some things over the course of time will just sort of shift on their own. We don't have to uh, uh, just deal with carbon. We can deal with potassium. Potassium, for example, will, will actually change into another element along the way. But a half-life is if I have like 100% here, let's say I have 100 pounds of something over the course of time, or this is 100 atoms, I guess, uh, over the course of time, as it disintegrates, 50% of them, as we're looking at this here, 50% of them will be gone, and 50% of them will have changed. You take that same amount of time, and again, another half have changed, and now we have 75 of the other. Take that same amount of time again, and another half will have changed, more or less. You can't get 12 and a half uh, uh, atoms. Uh, and, and, and sort of, you see it sort of goes slowly, slowly, slowly down. Different elements have different half-lives. Potassium has a very long half-life. Carbon-14 has a relatively short uh, half-life. So carbon-14 is good for dating things that are a couple of thousand years old, but won't help us date things that are millions or billions of years old. Potassium, on the other hand, will let us know what has happened in terms of billions of years. So we start out, this is called the parent-daughter relationship. This is the parent, and of course, the parent disintegrates as the daughter atoms accumulate up at the top along the way. So, so there are, are a, a number of things that, that can help. One thing that happens, of course, is uranium in uh, uranium-238 actually has 14 steps that will take it down, 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 down until it comes and finally stabilizes into lead. Uh, so notice that it starts out with 238 particles in it. Uh, not all of those are protons uh, uh, and, and uh, some are neutrons. So it will, will shift because you can have uranium-235, for example. That means three fewer uh, neutrons uh, along the way. And it goes down to get to lead down here to 206. So it's lost 32 particles in these 14 steps, some of which will be protons, because that's why it turns into lead. Uh, so uh, when we're looking at this, we need precision. It is a complex process. Uh, so, so when we're dealing with things, we need to uh, guard against outside influences. There's There are processes that can make it actually happen faster than, than it would if you just sort of left it unattended. So we need to watch for that. Uh, the oldest rocks on the earth are found on uh, continents, continental rocks, uh, 
usually not near the oceans, again, because of our sources of error here. And all continents, uh, including Antarctica, have shown rocks exceeding three and a half billion years old. Uh, so, so that gives us a long, long time uh, frame. Carbon-14, carbon is useful for dating things that are, are uh, life, uh, based on life, but it sort of peters out at about 70,000 years because the half-life is 5730 years. So uh, after 5730 years, we're left with half. Another 5730 years, we're left with half of that and half of that and half of that. So by the time we're talking 70,000 years or so, we've gone through so many halves, there's pretty much nothing left. Uh, carbon-14 is produced by cosmic ray bombardment uh, up in the atmosphere. Our atmosphere shields us from a lot of stuff, including X-rays and cosmic rays and uh, other, other kinds of things that are constantly hitting our planet, but uh, it does affect the upper atmosphere. Carbon-14 is absorbed by plants through photosynthesis, and uh, so all organisms, including you and me, uh, have a little bit of carbon-14. Things that are made out of uh, uh, anything living, like leather, will have carbon-14. So if we have, uh, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, we're on animal hides. Animal hides are organic. Uh, they had carbon-14. That's how we can tell how old they are, because they are less than one half-life. Uh, so it's, it's actually pretty easy to determine. Uh, so we have uh, uh, our carbon-14 process uh, that's here. Uh, we have sort of a... a sort of stable mass number in this way when we're going from nitrogen to carbon back to nitrogen uh, uh, along the way. But, but uh, just, just sort of be aware that this is a nuclear process involving the interior of the atom. So it's not just the electrons that are outside that are important for this. It is the, the uh, interior that happens. Uh, sedimentary rocks can rarely be dated directly because one of the problems there is we have lots of processes happening on them. Uh, so, so it's gonna throw the numbers off. So we use relative dating techniques there. Uh, but when we're dealing with uh, certain things, that especially igneous, uh, 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 igneous rocks, uh, that's where we can use radiometric dating along the way. So we could measure our volcanic ash down here. We could see our sort of igneous dike that, that's happening here, and we could measure those, and that could give us a sense that these things are going to be older. Uh, the, the formations underneath our volcanic ash will obviously be older than that. The Dakota sandstone will be newer than that, but it will be uh, also older than our igneous dike here. So when we're dealing with geological time scales, uh, we, we divide things into our units. Uh, we have eras. We have eons and eras, and eras then get divided into uh, uh, periods. And the uh, closer we are to where we live in our current time, we also break it into epochs. So we're in the Holocene epoch, in the Quaternary period, in the Cenozoic era, which is part of the Phanerozoic eon uh, that, that's here. Uh, so, so we we have uh, different different uh, time periods here. I think at least one of your quiz questions will deal with these kinds of, of questions. You might come back to this slide uh, rather than trying to memorize all of these. But if you want to go work at the the uh, museum in these Friends sitcom, uh, you you should learn all of these different kinds of things. Again, going back to that sitcom, there was a time where Joey, the actor was hired to be a tour guide. And of course, he couldn't pronounce a lot of these names along the way, Paleozoic and Mesozoic and Cenozoic. And uh, uh, so, so he just said everything was Jurassic because that's what he'd heard of from the movies. Everything's Jurassic, everything's Jurassic. Uh, and everything was before or after uh, the Jurassic Park. When we divide our eons, eons are the biggest expanse. Uh, so, so as you sort of notice back here, uh, we've really got the two main ones. Uh, we've got our sort of sub-eons that are, that are here uh, on, on the side. Eons are in eras. We sort of have our, our three main eras after the Precambrian 
uh, period there. And then, then of course, we have more and more uh, divisions the closer we get to our current time. Uh, Precambrian time, uh, four billion years prior uh, to the Cambrian period is all Precambrian. Uh, so we have sort of uh, uh, our before life and our ancient life. Uh, uh, this is Proterozoic before life and Archaean ancient life along the way. Uh, simple life forms didn't have much to them, so there's not uh, a, a lot of stuff in the Precambrian time period that was going to survive as fossils because they were very, very simple structures that could be uh, destroyed very easily. Uh, when we're looking at uh, terminology in the geologic scale, uh, we, we talk about the Hadean uh, time period as the earliest interval. And then geological time scale is continuously updated because we keep finding more and more things. So as we're looking at that, we segue into chapter 12. We can use these same concepts when we're looking at other planets as well. And part of why we look at other planets is to figure out our own stuff here on Earth. Uh, exoplanets, we're, we're de dealing a lot with that now, looking for other Earth-like planets. An exoplanet is any planet that's around another star. So all of our planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, not Uranus, Uranus and Neptune, and all of our dwarf planets, I'll give a shout out to Pluto. I should get a celebrity to do a shout out to Pluto. That would be fun. I'll, I'll look into that. So let's say, uh, I'll, I'll get one of the Star Trek people to, to shout out to Pluto. That sounds like it could be a lot of fun. Um, but, but anything outside of our solar system is an exoplanet. And when we are looking for another Earth, we're looking in the habitable zone. The habitable zone has a lot of things that are necessary. It needs to be the right planet in terms of structures. We'll talk about that a little bit. Has to be the right location, can't be too close to the sun, too hot, can't be too far away from the sun, too cold. That's true in other stars as well. Needs to also be the right time, because if you get in your time machine and go back four billion years to the Earth, the Earth is uninhabitable. There's not an atmosphere as we know it here, and it's probably going to be mostly molten most of the time. Uh, so, so we call this habitable zone the Goldilocks zone, because it's not too cold, it's not too hot, it's just right. And our Earth has evolved over time to be a Goldilocks planet. When we're looking at other examples, uh, there are different sizes of stars. Uh, we, we have uh, a classification system for stars. Take Astronomy 101 we'll, or, and 102, we'll talk about that there. Uh, but we do find some different kinds of planets that are around that could be within the habitable zone. The smaller the star, the closer the planet can be. The further away, uh, the, the brighter the star, the further away the planet has to be, otherwise it's up too close. Now, our history of Earth actually starts with the history of the entire universe, which right now we're estimating at 13.7 billion years. Uh, that number fluctuates here and there, although it doesn't fluctuate as much. When I was taking this course 35 years ago, that number was 20 billion years. Uh, we've since made adjustments. So we adjust it, but it's sort of like moving, 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 and we're sort of narrowing it down. Uh, so so, so this, is, this is close. Close is good in astronomy and a lot of science when you're dealing with really big numbers like this. Uh, this was the formation of the universe where the elements were formed, hydrogen and helium, the two main things in the sun, if you remember from our earlier chapters, were mostly created. Uh, there were a little bit of lithium as well at the time. Over time, stars form. As they form, they also have debris areas that are in a, a, a disk, which we call planetesimals, uh, that, that accrete, that's a process where things sort of form, often through collisions, and they turn into protoplanets. A planetesimal is a smaller piece, a protoplanet is something approaching uh, sort of moon-sized. You can have really big impacts. Earth's moon was formed when a Mars-sized object called Thea, I always have to point that out, my mother loves that because that was her name, and she liked being an earth-shattering force. Uh, uh, our, our 
our moon was formed when Thea hit the Earth, actually may have bounced off and hit it twice, shattering it and giving us a ring. The Earth had a ring like Saturn until the gravity, gravitational forces pulled it back together. Our early evolution, the Hadean Eon, which we talked about in the last chapter, the earliest time, we were very hot. We had repeated collisions over and over and over again. This was called the era of heavy bombardment because it was just a bunch of de debris out there. So we were being hit, 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 hit a lot. We were mostly molten. We, you don't want to get in your time machine and go back to this time period here. Uh, and then we sort of form as the galaxy forms, lots of different stars. We're around one of those two to 400 billion stars. As our star formed, we had the dust and debris disk that accreted, remember that word, accretion, that would then form into planets. But uh, the planetesimals would grow and grow and grow from repeated collisions and impacts, including things as large as something like Mars hitting us, which is how we got our moon. Uh, so at different times, we would have debris around our planet. Uh, we're actually getting that now because we're putting our own debris ring up. Our atmosphere contained mostly carbon dioxide and water vapor, H2O vapor, water vapor, uh, the carb CO2, uh, carbon uh, dioxide. Through outgassing, uh, these, of course, we were much more molten, so we were putting much, much, much more stuff into the atmosphere than we do now, but this process is still ongoing. Uh, this, whenever we have eruptions, whenever we have geysers, whenever we have outgassing things, uh, uh, events, that's actually returning things, recycling things back into the atmosphere. Uh, about three and a half billion years ago, uh, things were begin beginning to stabilize enough for basic life to start forming in the various uh, watery area, uh, uh, portions of the planet. And uh, photosynthesizing bacteria began to release oxygen. That's what plants do. Uh, so, so, and, and we, we have uh, different eras where, where we have more and less, but then we have what's called the great oxygenation event, which is uh, uh, when we got the kind of atmosphere that will support most of the life that we have today. Uh, so we have plants and we also have our outgassing, which includes uh, uh, oceans, but oceans also serve another uh, task, which is to pull some of the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So as we're looking at our continents, we have our sort of Precambrian era, uh, uh, and, and, and then we have our, our uh, uh, more recent era in terms of the continental structures. Uh, most of the Earth's crust uh, in terms of our continents was formed during the Precambrian times. Uh, so cratons form the core of modern continents. Large crustal areas had glommed together to form the cratons. Uh, the, the crustal areas were from fragments that collided as various melting parts of the mantles began to cool off and solidify. Uh, so so uh, this might have been what we would have seen mostly on our planet uh, four to four and a half billion years ago as things were forming along the way. But as, as uh, continents form, uh, you can sort of see here, we've got lots of areas of water, lots of areas of arcs and, and um, uh, sort of almost like, like peninsula type structures, except they're not actually attached to continents then. And uh, we can see how as they're shifting and moving, they form into more stable continents along the way. Our sort of, our, our crustal areas and our, our sort of our cratons um, sounds another, uh, like uh, from a science fiction novel, but, but uh, these, these are uh, some of the older areas and some of the newer areas here, the, the red areas here, uh, the Archaean cratons, those are the older areas. Uh, Proterozoic cratons are, uh, when it says GA here, we're talking 3.5 billion years ago, two and a half billion years ago, uh, up to one billion years ago. And then of course the, 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 the light brown stuff tends to be the newer stuff here. Notice the Himalayans, which we've talked about before, the older India subplate is pushing up that newer construction here. 
the bumping up against the Pacific and the Nazca plates is causing the bumping up of the mountains on the west coast of North and South America that's there. So not a lot of stuff that's older than three and a half billion years remains because things get recycled. Uh, lots of what we have today in terms of the current shapes were about a billion years old. When we look at our own territory here in North America, uh, we can see different names attached to areas that are less than a billion years old. The Appalachians are also less than a billion years old. Remember, they formed when we were bumping up against Africa, so that's not that long ago compared to areas, widespread areas in, say, Wyoming, the Wyoming area here, which includes Montana and Idaho and, and uh, parts of the uh, uh, Dakotas, as well as several provinces in Canada. Uh, this is one of the areas for uh, dinosaur hunting as well. Notice that it is quite old, but the dinosaurs were not there two and a half billion years ago. Uh, it's just that land was, was much steadier there. As continents have shifted around, sometimes they've all glommed together. We call those supercontinents. The most recent one was Pangaea, but that wasn't the only one. We've had things separate and converge and separate and converge and separate and converge in different ways. Uh, so, so we've had that happen several times. Pangaea wasn't even the largest one. Rodinia, which was earlier than Pangaea, was, was much larger. Uh, so here we have Rodinia. Notice Africa, South America, Northern Europe, North America. All, all of the continents we know today, including the India subcontinent, way over here is sort of off uh, in, in, in there. Uh, so, so, so this is just a possible structure uh, that we have here. Uh, notice as you're looking at this, what happened to Asia? Uh, we have all of the major continents, except we've got this little rump of Siberia here, uh, and, and it's not even, it's nowhere near the largest. So, so we can sort of see the shifting of things. And the South Pole is in the middle of Africa. So it, we, we live on a weird planet in many ways. As these things shift around, it dramatically changes our climate. It can significantly change our sea levels uh, as, as we have uh, the floor spreading or other things being pushed up uh, along the way. So as we're looking at the way things shift around, we have cross currents in our oceanic uh, uh, environment. We have what's called the oceanic conveyor where things from the North Atlantic go into the South Atlantic that connect over into the Indian Ocean, and from there actually peripherally relate to the Pacific Ocean, which has its own currents. So we have this worldwide current kind of thing happening. Uh, but when we, we, when we are, are having more water or less water, depending on the glacier and, and ice amounts on Antarctica and Greenland, and uh, during ice ages on the top of the planet, as well, these can shift around in different ways, and, and it does make a difference globally for the, the, uh, uh, the climate. So these are our different eras. Uh, we're in the Cenozoic era, recent life below it, before us as Mesozoic and Paleozoic, and these are all part of the Phanerozoic era, eon, which is visible life. Uh, so basically the life that we're used to. It's life, Jim, but yes, as we know it. Uh, there's another Star Trek reference. You're all too young for Star Trek, and that's why the Star Trek people are saying, you may not know who I am, go and watch it. I should give extra credit for people watching it uh, uh, along the way. So, so as we look at these things, we can see different mountain ranges that were forming. Uh, Appalachians are due to Pangaea when everything was combined. Uh, here we can sort of see different structures. Sometimes we have other names for Gondwana, uh, that sounds like it should be in, in one of the superhero movies uh, there. And Laura Asia and Pangaea, these are all names that could uh, be, be very, uh, very useful in the uh, either Marvel or DC universes along the way. Uh, but it, things sort of move and separate, move and separate. And we can sort of see how Europe and North America used to be much closer to each other. Uh, we can see exactly how South America and North America used to be attached to Africa, but that wasn't always the case and is no longer the case along the way. So uh, we, we have, uh, as, as a result of that, not just the breakup and sea level changes, but also coal. We are here in North America, the Saudi Arabia of coal, because of ancient processes like this that have formed. 
and uh, much of North America has been above sea level uh, for, for a very long time, but we have had some areas, again, like Utah and, and Nevada, which were underwater uh, quite a bit. So when we're talking about fossils, uh, I don't want to go too, too much into this. We've talked a little bit about it before. There's a lot of debate uh, in terms of when life started. You have to have the right material. You have to have uh, proteins. You have to have nucleic acids. You have to have carbon. Uh, you have to have oxygen. You have to have uh, uh, some, some kind of, of, of watery basis or, or some kind of liquid basis. That's at least what we think today, but that's being debated and continues to be debated. What hospitable means? Well, some places, some things like it hot. Some things like it really cold. Uh, the oldest fossils are three and a half billion years old or so. Uh, so that means our planet took about a billion years before fossils started forming. That doesn't mean, however, that there weren't things before then. And we can sort of see the development here, uh, how, how life has, has grown and changed over this time. Uh, so our first life, single-celled organisms, bacteria, uh, uh, one of the things that we have is uh, use of solar energy because there weren't plants to eat. Uh, and and uh, so, so things would have been relatively near the surface or uh, they would have been near volcanic vents, which they can also use for uh, uh, energy. And so some of the oldest stuff would build up uh, sort of the leftover from behind. And we have stromatolites uh, that are found in places like Australia and South Africa, which as you watch the continents used to be right next to each other. So we have these sort of structures that are formed. These are sort of the, the, the old leftover colonies of stromatolites that are there. And then we have the growth into uh, more complex multicellular organisms. Then we had what was called the Cambrian explosion, which is when just life took off and changed in all sorts of different uh, directions, including lots of different uh, invertebrates uh, all throughout. Mo notice mostly these kinds of things are going to be oceanic, uh, but over a course of time, things begin to develop hard shells. That's great for us. The skeletons are also great for us in terms of, of uh, uh, fossil life. Then we also have uh, land plants that begin to evolve from things that are floating on the ocean and take hold on land and don't go back. Uh, vertebrates also evolve from uh, fish that again sometimes are on land, sometimes are not on land, and then eventually evolve to be completely on land. Uh, we still have some things, uh, for example, like frogs uh, that can live in the water uh, when they're, they're, they're sort of born in the water, they eventually leave the water. Uh, we have different, different, uh, but they still need the water environment to survive. We've had different extinction periods, including the Great Permian extinction, uh, where, where lots of things on the planet died off. This has happened again and again. Uh, the organisms that survive then repopulate. Uh, so, so this is, it has happened again and again in, in our history. The, the death of the dinosaurs was not the only one. Uh, this, this has happened a number of times. So in the Mesozoic era, dinosaurs take over. Uh, they also evolve in the sea. They evolve in the sky. Birds are the, the leftovers of dinosaurs. So it's sort of a myth that dinosaurs died off. They didn't die off, just the reptilian sort of one that's chasing me in the background here did. Uh, birds are still around. If you look at a bird skeleton and a dinosaur, what you would consider typical dinosaur skeleton, uh, they, they look very similar in, in, in many ways. So, so we have some transitional forms here, this really interesting Archaeopteryx, uh, which is sort of uh, in, in, in the stone here, which, which is quite, quite fascinating because we can see the outline of the feathers. The feathers themselves did not survive. Uh, but then again, uh, 65 million years ago, mass extinction uh, caused by uh, volcanic eruptions and or a meteor impact. Of course, the meteor impact is the most likely uh, explanation. And we have the Chicxulub crater off the uh, coast, or actually right on the coast, I won't say off the coast, of the Yucatan in Mexico, 
Uh, this is a double whammy because it hit both the ground and the water. So the water vapor uh, vaporization as well as the dust being kicked up from the land as well as the disintegration of the asteroid itself uh, give us quite the covering of the planet. There's something called the iridium layer which comes from this we believe and all dinosaur bones have ever been found below this because as it kicked up dust and debris into the atmosphere it covered the entire planet. That's not unusual because the fires that are happening in California right now, give it two years and you'll be able very fine trace amounts that we can already sense that in our atmosphere here in Indiana. After two years, that ash will have spread all over the Northern Hemisphere and into the Southern Hemisphere. Mammals actually survived this extinction because they were small, they could eat, let much less than the huge dinosaurs required. They also, for the most part, were warm-blooded and thus could survive the temperature changes. And we have evolved from that. Uh, but I'm not going to go too much into uh, those kinds of things also because, hey, you can take a biology class as well. Uh, but uh, so join me again for chapters 13 and 14 coming up here shortly, and I will see you then.